This is so fun. Um, thank you for coming. Welcome. We are super, super excited um, for this panel. Um, my name is Ellie Rocher. Uh, I am, I work with teenagers and young adults at Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Bethlehem has been a longtime partner now of the Global Immersion Project. Um, several Bethlehem folks on this call today right now um, have been on immersions with the Global Immersions Project to, um, to the borderlands in San Diego, Tijuana and the borderlands in Israel and Palestine. Um, and um, we are going to start by introducing uh, the other folks on the panel uh, and we'll go from there. So if you are a panel member, um, why don't you introduce yourself with your name, um, your location in the country, um, and your year in school, and then we'll launch into our content. Um, so Gabe, would you go first, please? Yeah, hi, so I am Gabe Grimm. Um, I am a freshman at University of San Diego, but I'm currently in Seattle, Washington. So yeah. Fantastic. Um, how about Ivy? Hi, I'm Ivy Mendez. I'm going to be a junior and I'm in Salem, Oregon. And junior in high school. Yes. Yeah. yes. Awesome. Henry. Uh, I'm Henry Ingstrom. Uh, I'm going next year. I'm going to be a sophomore in college. Um, and I'm in Edina, Minnesota. Thank you. Ellen. Hey, I'm Ellen Weber. Um, I work at Bethlehem Lutheran Church in the Twin Cities. Um, and I am not in school currently. Um, but I work, I'm a youth worker working with ninth through 12th grade and young adults. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm going to have Ryan introduce himself as well. He is the co-facilitator of this panel and um, he's also a history teacher. So I asked him to say a couple things about how the subject of this panel is not an, is not isolated. Um, we are seeing so many young people bringing their faith out into the streets, um, doing amazing things in the world to bring about reconciliation. Um, but this is not the first time in history that it, that has happened. So he's going to give us a little bit of a historical context to place us uh, in this conversation in 2020. Right. Right. Uh, Twin Cities are representing really strongly here. So I want to want to give a shout out there. My <clears throat> before I met you all, my only sort of access point to the Twin Cities was uh, Gordon Bombay, Milo Estevez from the Muddy Duck series. But I don't know if they were ever actually in the Twin Cities. I just thought I'd, you know, give a shout out to my childhood there. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, it's been crazy for me as a teacher right now, a teacher, a uh, high school teacher of history and social justice, uh, to try to bring closure to a school year in the midst of COVID. Um, I, I can only imagine how the families, the, the parents of students, the students, the, the teachers and staff have been experiencing this time. Um, so I wanted to make sure I gave some love to all those people that have just like responded, reacted and tried to um, make the education system uh, whatever version it could be for these last few months. Um, yeah, before, before we talk about invite the students in for their stories, I really wanted to try to place this moment in time, 2020, June 2020, into a larger historical context. Uh, and not just like history, there's, there's a lot of unrest, there's injustice and, and responses to that, but also centering it on the stories of young people showing up. Um, so I created a timeline uh, that I want to read off, but before I read that off, I want to sort of try to give those listening a, a frame of reference, some prompts to consider, some filters with which to receive the timeline. So consider these things. How can we use student movements of the past as learning laboratories for activism in the present? Young people are often told that they are the future and that's supposed to sound inspiring, right? Uh, but students, student movements and my own interactions in classrooms show me that young people are not content with just being the future if the now is unjust. 
uh, they've chosen, students have chosen to show up in the past and they are choosing now to show up as well. Uh, what does it mean for those in power, typically the parents and grandparents generation, to get curious when your young people speak up rather than saying things like, you'll, you'll understand when you're older or wait till you can vote. What does it look like to get curious with the young people in your life? Mm -hmm. If you end up as a grandparent someday, or maybe you are already, um, you should consider the fact that there's probably going to be a history teacher at some point that gives your child or grandchild a project that says, ask relative where they were when. How did they respond when? Uh, consider how will you answer that question about June 2020 as you listen to these, uh, these student activists. <sighs> yes, students show up and lock arms in solidarity, but history and present show me that the intended audience for protests are those with power. Those with power still at home, watching on TV, uh, following it on social media. It's a plea for those with economic and, and political power to see their own humanity as tied to the humanity of all people and leverage that power towards justice. So those are the filters I want you to consider as I, as I read these things off. As a teacher, I'm convicted and inspired by my students' ability to see unfairness. When I see movements right now in response to systems of injustice against in particular black US Americans, I see so many young people showing up. Take you back to 1903, the March of the Mill Children in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 100,000 workers in Philadelphia protested working conditions in textile mills. 10,000 of those workers protesting the conditions were under the age of 15. 1951, 16-year-old Barbara Johns leads a walkout of her all black high school in Farmville, Virginia to protest the inequality because of Jim Crow segregation. This student movement at this school would then become one of the, the storylines story for Brown versus Board of Education 1954 that attempted to desegregate schools and communities. Little Rock Nine in 1957, nine black students uh, attempt to test Brown versus Board of Education in Little Rock, Arkansas, and need federal troops sent in to walk them into school. 1963, the Children's Crusade, Birmingham, Alabama, over a thousand students skip school, many of them skip school in protest, and many of them end up in jail. 1963, Chicago Freedom Day boycott, over 200,000 Chicago students, mostly students from communities of color, walk out of school to protest the uh, unfair, unequal school conditions that they have. 1964, and I just learned about this one, nearly 465,000 New York City students, mostly black students and Puerto Rican students, walk out of school, stay home from school and protest uh, because of school conditions there. Some of you may have heard of Tinker versus Des Moines, this, uh, this Supreme Court case in 1965 that challenged um, can students be able to protest in school? And they said yes, as 13-year-old Mary Beth Tinker wore a black armband to school to protest the US war in Southeast Asia. The East LA walkout in 1968, 20, 22,000 mostly Mexican-American students walk out of class to again protest the horrible conditions in their schools as compared to uh, students in white neighborhoods. Fast forward to 2006, protests across the country. Hundreds of thousands of students show up um, to protest anti-immigration legislation that was moving at that point uh, and calling for their system to be reformed. In 2014, emerging from the murder of uh, Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, three young black women in their 30s show up and create the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, many of us see what's happened since then and in the present day uh, with regards to the Black Lives Matter as a movement. And so much of that is fueled by young people, in particular protesting the uh, injustice of the school to prison pipeline. 2016, indigenous youth show up at protests against the Dakota Access Pipeline construction at the Standing Rock Reservation. 2018, March for Our Lives, young people in the aftermath of the shooting at Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida, they show up to protest uh, gun violence in America. At least 1.2 million young people march in that first weekend. 
And this brings us to the present day and the, uh, the student activists that are with us here and their leaders. Thank you, Ryan. Whew, I'm all fired up now. <laughs> let's, just, let's just go, let's just go, go, go do something right now. I'm just kidding. This is what we're doing right now, very much on purpose. And we're very much on purpose doing this on Juneteenth, right? So happy Juneteenth to you all. Um, I want to echo one thing that Ryan said, the two things that tick me off the most when I hear them is the youth are the future. And that makes me so mad because the youth are the now, right? And they shouldn't have to wait for a better day. And we're seeing them not take that line very well. Um, don't you dare put that off for any human, right? Um, the other thing that makes me mad is when with maybe um, an ageist tone, oh, look at our young people leading. <laughs> and when you say that, you better be ready to listen to what they're saying and you better be willing to follow. I hear so many people say, look at the youth leading as a way that they can stay on the couch and stay comfortable and do nothing, right? So I'm so excited and honored to be mediating this panel um, as a way to li keep listening and, um, and keep following because I really believe that young people are our modern day prophets in a way with they, they understand when things are unjust and they automatically know how to push levers um, to, to activate their power within systems. And it's really, really inspiring. And I, because of the context that I'm working, I see all of this as spiritual practice, um, as things that, that we're being called to do in our faith. Um, so today, June 19th, Juneteenth, this is a day that we celebrate the end of slavery in our country. And one thing that I'm feeling this year as a shift, this I believe is a very positive shift, is that I feel in the past that Juneteenth was kind of considered something that African American Black folks celebrate. And um, the truth is that our entire country should be celebrating the end of slavery. Um, and some, I feel like more people are getting curious about what, um, what this day is all about, what the history is behind this day, and what we should be doing. Um, and so this panel is on Juneteenth very much on purpose um, as something that we can do uh, as a free country to continue to evolve and grow um, as a group of people toward um, freedom, real freedom, and real justice, and to be doing it as an act of faith. Um, so now we're going to turn it over to some of the, the student activists. I'm going to um, start by asking Gabe. Um, so Gabe, June is, we're in the middle of Pride Month, right? We just got an amazing um, vote of good news from the Supreme Court. There's a lot to celebrate and that are, there's a lot of work to do. Um, what are you and your peers doing in terms of getting out on the street with your faith? Um, to support the rights of LGBTQIA folks. Yeah, it is Pride Month. Um, so, so just to clarify, the recent court decision was that the um, United States Supreme Court ruled that um, anyone who identified as um, LGBTQIA plus can no longer be discriminated in their job. Um, before, I think like, around 11 states had that and there was some some policies for um, public workers but now overall they cannot be discriminated and that was from um, that followed after three workers were fired from um, jobs because of being transgender because of um, their sexuality or um, being involved in organizations that supported that so um with that, I think the first thing when I found out um, was just like celebrating with the people that I know that that impacts because they were like certain people in my life who um, have that, that experience and are not heterosexual or in the, you know, typical binary. They were like, this is like insane. Like this is going to go down in history. Like let's celebrate. Um, so I think, I mean, first of all, it's a victory, but there's still so much progress to be made as our country relies on a lot of different systems that are subjective um, in employment and criminal justice and all these things. So how do we move forward 
uh, use this momentum and like, where do we start? I think for me, um, growing up in an, an evangelical environment, um, the topic of homosexuality and transgender is confusing for so many people. I think growing up, I, um, I didn't really know much about the topic. Being in that environment, I wasn't exposed to many people who um, were openly ex expressing their sexuality or gender in that way. Um, and so I think for me, part of it was just educating myself on other people's experiences um, and figuring out where that discrimination comes from. Um, there's one book that I found really helpful, which is called Changing Our Minds by David Gushi, and that's um, just a really powerful book that I read, but I think that's also a form of change that we can suggest to other people. Um, but in this part of this month, for me, has been, um, whether that's related to Pride or the Black Lives Matter movement, has been phone calls. Um, and just, not, I mean, not like targeting people and be like, hey, you believe different than me, like, let's fight about it. But just like, even finding people in my inner circle and saying like, how are you experiencing this? Um, whether that's like the national environment or the recent court ruling um, and kind of gauging like some answers I've heard is like, well, it's kind of confusing because like I've heard this and this is what I've been around, but like this also seems like a really good thing and there seems like there's a lot of different impacting factors to it. Um, so I think one of the biggest things for change is just conversation and that's hard because we don't like engaging when in, in conversation that's controversial like that. It's really confusing. Sometimes you feel like you need to be educated on certain things and everything. Um, and going to a Catholic university now, um, it's, it's really interesting how there is, I mean, a lot of people aren't religious there, but there is that population. Um, this year at my school, someone had their door like terrorized and had all these notes put up and um, all of this stuff. And then uh, students responded. We responded by, well, first of all, the person who was affected um, was just very mature and stood up for themselves and posted about it online. And then a lot of people started reposting that. And then, um, Ultimately, the person who was, who did it was discovered and expelled from the school. Um, but the university, like that momentum carried into the university authority and then action was taken. So I think even as we can support people who have um, other experiences than ourselves, even in the smallest ways is a really big thing. Um, bigger than we accredit sometimes. Kind of going off of pride, but moving into the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, just for example, I, part of my work has been, um, well, one, asking people, ask, not asking people, but asking myself, why am I posting this? Or why am I doing this or this? Um, because I recently read a stat that says if you post about it, you're less likely to actually do anything. Um, and is, is this like me trying to show off to my other white friends, look, I'm a good activist? Or is it me like being patient and then saying like, this is helpful, uplifting, um, and dignifying content? Um, but what I was going to say is I was trying to support um, people who are Black in my life and who were sharing content. Uh, and vulnerable stories in this time and everything. And I direct messaged someone on Instagram. And at first, and I was like, I was like, thank you for this content. And at first she was like, are you sarcastic? Um, or are you being sarcastic? And I was like, and then I sent her a pair a, like a short paragraph. And I was like, no, like, I just know that um, it can be hard to share this kind of content in this time because she was kind of saying how she was in a controversial environment. 
And then she responded with, she was like, thank you so much. That means so much. It's been really hard to share all of this. But I think even in myself, I overlooked what it means to support people who are experiencing that. Um, whether it is Black people with Black Lives Matter, whether that's um, people who are homosexual, but just like that is a really strong way when we can encourage people because then they have more momentum to use their voices too. Totally. Okay, I'm hearing so much that I love. So part of our part of our work is to learn and unlearn, right? And books is, are a great way to do it because we it can be at, on our time in our pace we can digest um in a way that that transforms us um making phone calls i have had that instinct as well where like to step off social media and actually just engage in the relationships that are existing and have meaningful conversations um i hear you saying that you can look at the institutions you're already a part of school being one of them and start to push levers right um as a as an active member in that institution so that the structures um can be can change and be safer for people to exist within and i just i love what you said about posting right does it bring dignity like inserting a pause before you post asking about your intention and then supporting folks um, on social media as well as um, outside of thank you that was amazing i really appreciate you um ivy you ready so <laughs> I met Ivy in Tijuana um, for the first time. We had a great time there at the TGIP Summit. And um, I asked her to speak about um, immigration rights because um, there's so much to do in that area. Um, again, had an amazing Supreme Court decision um, in terms of DACA, really big. Ivy, what are you thinking about? What are you doing? What are your peers doing to continue the conversation about immigration rights? Yeah, so to, su again, to summarize what happened, um, as of yesterday, the Supreme Court blocked the Trump administration's attempts to end DACA, which is the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And that's really big and really great news because that's protecting hundreds of thousands of immigrants who were brought into the US as children. And so that's really great news. And I was personally really happy to hear about that just because I know per people personally who that's great news for and is quite literally saving their lives. Um, and yeah, just throughout this whole time, I've been almost sensing like a lot of anger and frustration from a lot of youth and from a lot of people my age, um, just towards different like social justice movements. Um, recently in my English class for our final, we had to write a paper about immigration because of the book we were reading the Bean Trees actually talks about immigration and undocumented immigrants. And I had a lot of interesting conversations with friends as we worked on those essays, because for the first time they were being exposed to this topic. Mm. And I really don't think it's discussed as much with youth, just because it's such a complex topic mm -hmm. with like a lot of mature details that you have to think about, because you have to consider laws and policies and so many other like political things and so it's really hard to like take that all in and comprehend it as a teenager um but yeah just having those conversations with my friends was amazing to watch their eyes be open to like all the injustice of it because i live i have a predominantly white friend group and so really they're not affected by this very much and at least at my school it's not discussed as much because again my school is predominantly white and so it was just really interesting to see like them learn about all of this and start to like realize it and so that's where i've really been sensing like this feeling of like anger and frustration towards the system but then like there's so much potential to do something but we just don't know where to go because we're all young and we can't vote yet and i feel like a lot of times with immigration it's a lot of like voting and making laws and passing and doing making policies um, but I just feel like something that's really important right now is to just educate yourself on the topic and just to start learning and to maybe not necessarily reach out to people that like are potentially undocumented, but just like learning from people who are openly speaking about this topic, because I think it's the most important thing is like having personal stories to learn from. And I feel like that's what the most moving thing is for me is when I went on the what is it, the 
Borderlands trip? Yes, thank you. The Borderland trip was just sitting in those shelters and listening to their stories. Because as heartbreaking as that was, it gave me a new perspective on it. And it really helped me keep shaping and forming my opinion. And along with what Gabe said, I feel like as Christians, it's also really difficult for us to discuss this because we're, as Christians, like we don't want to be political, you know? Like we just want to have like our little bubble of like religion and then everything else like around us is like can be political, but we don't want to like reach out into that and we don't want to connect the two worlds together. But I think it's important for us to do that because we can't just keep putting ourselves and Jesus in a box and calling that box us and then everyone else is them because Jesus wasn't in us. Jesus was a them and he always advocated for the other and he was an other. And so I think that's just really important that like we need to start, like our first step to do something is starting to realize that like Jesus was not a white privileged person. He was the other and he was the discriminated against and the oppressed. And yeah, that's, that's a hard thing that people have to realize. And so overall, I just really think with this topic, the biggest thing is just to educate yourself and just to start learning and listening to stories and just forming your own opinion, especially as youth, because eventually we're going to be voting and we're going to be passing laws and making policies that are going to drastically affect hundreds of thousands of people. And I really hope that those decisions that we make are educated and are well thought through. Ah, uh, preach it, sister. Okay. <laughs> yes, that was amazing. Um, some of the things I was thinking about as you were talking is how um, in terms of immigration rights, we have to work a little tiny bit harder right now because it's not the headlines, right? But like you said, there's so, um, there's so many things we need to educate ourselves on. So we're, we're voting with, um, with information. Um, and also when you, you said you, you find yourself in a fairly white circle with school. So you went to Tijuana and sat down and listened. Um, that's not happening as much anymore, right? So how can we be boundary crossers within our own immediate context? So we're, we're digging under the headlines to find good information and we're, um, we're, we're situating ourselves where we're hearing stories that are going to affect us, right? I love your image of um, us and them and how the church loves to do that to keep ourselves comfortable um, and how we need to break out of that right now. Um, fantastic. And the, I, we put the word dissent in the title of this conversation on profess. There is a rub there. We do want to stay comfortable and the, the time is calling us to get out and be uncomfortable and break down the barrier between politics and religion, right? I love it. Thank you so much. Um, so Henry and Ellen um, are both situated in the Twin Cities area of Minnesota. So I'm going to ask you both um, to speak to um, the world as of May 25th, right? Um, Henry, I would love to hear from you. Um, being so close into proximity where George Floyd was murdered, um, what you're thinking about, what you're doing, what you're seeing people do um, in terms of racial justice in the Twin Cities. Uh, we'll start with you. And then Ellen, I would like to hear from you as a young adult, um, because you're doing so much in your circle of people, but then also what are you seeing as someone who is walking alongside um, youth in this moment. I think you both have a really special proximity um, to the energy of this movement because um, because George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, which was so close to us. Um, so Henry, would you mind starting for us? Uh, yeah. Um, so basically what I'm seeing is like a lot of young people, a lot more than I ever really saw before are getting engaged and interested in uh, new ways and they um, seem more willing to uh, be active and engaged than yeah than I've ever seen it's really it's really kind of crazy seeing a lot of people who usually I would think of as being apolitical starting to go out and uh, fight for change and stuff um, and then yeah just the interesting you know conversations because um, people tend to think of me as a more political person so then I've had people reach out to me and say, what is, what's happening? What's going on? How, how do I help? Um, 
what's right, what's wrong, what do I, how do I do the, and engage, engage in a way that is productive and helpful. Um, Cause yeah, the, the young people around here really uh, did not take this well. Um, they, yeah, they're that's, mad, so. That's right. Yeah. And what, what do you tell them when they ask you? Um, I try and um, point them in the right direction to be informed. Um, you know, uh, resources on, online, a lot of, a lot of online activism is what I'm seeing. So people are uh, posting more than they're going out because they can't go out or um, whatever, but trying to make sure that they are uh, educated before they start making moves is that's my number one priority because I don't want them um, it's it's one thing to go out and you know punch police officers but to actually be educated and know what you you're talking about and what you're doing is a whole different thing and more uh, how to make a much better more positive impact yeah that's right so you have one of the biggest brains I know, and um, one of the things I love when you when you talk, you're you're not flashy. We got to dig for it, but there is, you are so well read, and there's a wealth of knowledge where you can see connections and patterns through history. Like what, what are you what are you thinking about? Like what does this moment? What are other moments in history that you're drawing connections with and seeing patterns? Um. Okay. Well. So it. The thing that it's funny you mention that because um, the thing about that is um, it made me desensitize to the, the police killing of black men to the point where I saw that George Floyd vi video and almost didn't think any I thought it, it was just another Monday for me um, until people started throwing stuff and it became a thing because that is. It, yeah, it was just so, that's the number one thing uh, for me as far as like historically speaking and the extrajudicial killing of, of black men in America. It's not new. Um, so then what I've been telling people who are, de they're devastated. Um, a lot of people feel like personally hurt by um, these police officers. And I, it's where I come in, I say, it's been worse. Um, this is not the end of the world, um, but it's also, this is not gonna end soon. Um, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, stuff like that. Like it's, um, people need to, to don't seem to have this in the context of, of um, history, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, so when um, people, if people are surprised by this, they haven't been paying attention. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, my example, so from the Jewels, they came out with an album that I've been listening to like every day since it came out. Um, but it it's really good and they, there's a line where he says, I can't breathe, which um, is what George Floyd said, but it was recorded in November of 2019. Mm. So it's, mm. yeah, it's, yeah, that's. Um, can you, can you tell, can you give us an example of somewhere you're sending people to get to educate themselves? Um, yeah, the, um, for me, uh, YouTube is a big resource. There are a few like really good YouTube videos that, that break down police violence and um, the system because people don't really read books. Um, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, has websites and um, it's, you know, there are link trees you can follow to get educated. Like uh, there are uh, paste and uh, just links that you can send um, full of resources that people can look and see the graphs and the statistics and the, 
everything like that. Um, and then I guess one more thing is um, making sure that people have the right information. So I'm, I, the other thing I've been trying to do is look at, because people are always posting now, like every day someone has a new, uh, you know, a Twitter screenshot or, or whatever they're putting on their um, Instagram and Facebook. Um, and I, I try and make sure that they have the right information. So um, that's a big thing, because I think it's, it's worse, it's pretty bad when someone you agree with is misinformed. I don't, I don't, I don't like to see that, so I try and uh, fix that where I can. Do you, do you have any hunches of why this, like, why this is different this time? Um, like why people are so angry this time? It's a really long video. Um, and all of it is a, a murder of, like, it's, it's not like yeah. a shooting. Uh, those, that's, you know, this is like, eight minutes and 46 seconds that's insane um and then here it's here like i can point to the spot where it happened um that's a big part of where it is for me and then it just the timing is awful to people have been inside for three months and then uh something infuriating happens and then they get mad um so kind of a perfect storm of things. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Emily. Um, I love, I love um, adding, and I'm doing this to you, adding the title to what you said in terms of like making sure you're not promoting misinformation as an act of spiritual practice. <laughs> you know, I just, and like getting yourself educated. I just, I love that. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. How about you, Ellen? Yeah, kind of going off of what Henry just said, um, I think it's an interesting time of you have people who are at home, people have been laid off, that they have um, at times more flexibility to show up where it's like, oh, it's not, I am at home, it's just me, um, here's an opportunity because I have a more flexible schedule or I'm not as worried about um, yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting time to have the pandemic. You know, you didn't see the same thing when Slandel Castile, um, you know, still in St. Paul, um, was murdered. And so, um, I think there is, um, you know, I showed up in the street four years ago in a protest and, it, and there's something different, um, about this. And I think the pandemic does add a layer on top of that, um, where people are showing up. Um, and so in regards to young adults, um, there's been a few different things that have been going on around me. Um, and one is like that on Tuesday, right after, um, on May 26, um, people are just showing up at 38 in Chicago. So I was with my brother, um, and inviting other people to join you. And so I noticed like, oh, there were young adults that as I was sharing, as I was interested in certain protests, I think that was one way for me to keep up of like, there are so many things going on in the city. Um, that the minute I said I was interested in going, I would get people responding like, hey, are you going to this? Like having the desire to show up, um, but not having someone to go with. Um, and so putting the invitation out there for someone to show up and be like, hey, come with me. And it was a lot of the people from Bethlehem. It's like, hey, let's go together and show uh, that this is a spiritual act to show up and to listen. Um, and I think that is one of the best ways to be educated is um, there was a moment outside of the governor's mansion and I have never been to a protest where that was not on the city cap or on the Capitol lawn that we all sat on the ground. So it was this group uh, of leaders that were standing up and everyone in the crowd was sitting down um, to ensure that everyone heard and listened um, and that was powerful. Um, and that's one form is to show up in the street and to listen and hear what they have to say. Um, so that's one thing with the young adults. Um, also having young adults come to me and asking uh, advice for how to have conversations with their family um, has been something that's happened a lot um, of how to have those difficult conversations with people 
Um, if you don't know the intercultural continuum, uh, I would the IDI or the I uh, I would look that up. Um, that's a good resource for how to how to um, talk to someone who's in a place where it's us versus them, like Ivy was talking about. Um, where can how can you move them to start to see? Because they're not going to jump to um, where you might be, um, but there are ways where you can start to um, show them similarities between people. Um, another way, another thing that recently happened um, is we have, um, we've had some meetups in person with some of the young people. So we had a ninth grade and a 10th grade one. Um, and we brought up, uh, we brought up the murder of George Floyd um, as a gathering of people um, from Bethlehem. Uh, where I asked them to share their thoughts and feelings about the protests, about police brutality, to ask questions, um, and to have a space where they can be honest about how they're feeling. And we heard um, them potentially, you know, trying some stuff out of listening, of hearing, okay, what, are, what am I hearing in the media? What are my parents saying? Oh, what do I feel about the destruction that's happening? Um, we had someone ask, um, after I encourage them to ask questions, ask about the police kneeling and why is that bad? So creating a space where where they can be vulnerable and and say the things that are actually going in their mind and maybe say something that they have a bias towards, but be able to to love on them instead of shame them. And um, yeah, I think that's been huge. Of like, where are the spaces? Like, this is a very important moment for those young people that it could be, oh, if I ask this question, I'm gonna be shamed and shut down and I'm not gonna ask the question. I'm not gonna go find the answer. I'm not gonna be educated on it. I'm gonna shut down and just continue to believe what I believe and kind of whatever I'm get, getting fed. But if you open, the, open it up to like curiosity, like, hey, this might be another perspective. This is another layer on top of it um, that I want you to think about. You can, out of relationship with someone, um, you can challenge them in a, in a way that brings love. Um, so yeah, those are a couple of things that I've seen. Challenge them in a way that brings love. <laughs> it's, you know, it's not easy, but when we're starting from relationship, um, and like you said, this is a very big moment to create loving spaces for people to explore and try things out and be, we were, you're at, I, I witnessed this, you're asking people to like, step up into new dignity, right? And to walk mm -hmm. around something 360 degrees. Um, and what can we do that elicits curiosity so that it's a conversation that folks are entering into um, in their own accord? That's awesome. Um, Ivy and Gabe, Ryan, do you have anything to add to what you heard Henry and Ellen say? This obviously is a movement that's global right now. How are you seeing people show up for for the Black Lives Matter movement. Okay, um, I will go. I saw you turn off your mic. Um, I think for me, how I'm, I think it's, it's hard because um, I, I think Henry was right when he said, or I, I forget who said, but someone was saying how people want to go but don't necessarily have a platform or there's COVID or yeah. um, all these other things and it can be really confusing. I think um, people want to engage, but it's like, I don't know the education. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, and it can seem like a really in, like sensitive environment. Um, a lot of the black activists that I follow have been, um, definitely have called a need for justice, but also have been, have shared certain things that is like, like as some perspectives are evolving, let's share, show grace um, and encourage curi curiosity in people who don't really have that experience. So. Um, I think I'm seeing a lot of my friends be curious and I'm having people call me and, or just even reach out and be like, like, I don't know what to do. I'm 
I'm doing this and this. Um, and I think my first response is like, how, how can you like, is, is there people in your life that you could have conversations with? Is there your family that you could have conversations with? Um, I ended up going to a protest with my dad who was the only, you know, a six-year-old white bald guy in the crowd I think I mean definitely diverse crowd but um just how we can find certain people in our life and invite them in providing um not only opportunity but also someone to do that with um and then you know what that looks like in our careers moving forward but I think just like I think as you said earlier Ellie um with people I think you mentioned that youth often have a um, more um, a easier to see injustice these days. And I think how I've been best described that is because of an evolving conscious over time. Um, and just, I think even in myself, I think that often we think there's a place when you arrive at ally, allyship, yeah. um, when really it's something like, like, I'm never going to know how to react initially first. I have to listen and then see how, um, like what that looks like. But I, I don't know. And it's a constant process. And I think giving people in our lives that simultaneous opportunity and grace. You know, it makes me think of the Bible story where I heard one interpretation of when Jesus is quiet and is drawing in the sand, that he's just buying himself some time <laughs> to decide what he's going to say. And, you know, there's so many beautiful interpretations of that moment, but it's one that I kind of have some, in, like, I'm draw drawn to in terms of, like, just inserting some time, listening, thinking a little of it um, can be a really good thing. That's beautiful. Gabe, thank you. Right. Yeah, I um, I think about white supremacy in the United States and how white people were the creators of the systems of injustice, and we need to be the ones to dismantle that rather than constantly putting the burden back on, um, in this case, Black Americans or in other cases, um, Indigenous to the um, to America. <laughs> we need to be the ones to do the work rather than constantly asking and putting the burden on um, the marginalized communities. I, I think about the anti-racism journey as a journey and uh, how do I both speak my truth and invite your truth needs to be spoken, but as someone disconnected from the underset of power, I also need to figure out a way to, even in my anger, continue to show up for my people because it's up to me to believe in their ability to be transformed because someone did the same for me. Mm -hmm. um, and if I feel like I'm at step five of the anti-racism journey, just pretend, and someone else is at step three, um, I, I need to figure out what places of proximity got me from three to four to five and engage with that person that's at step three through like the step three sort of filter rather than expecting them to be where I'm at. I need to like pass the mic rather than just drop the mic and expect them to, to, um, to pick it up. That's, that's what I've been learning. You know, chapter one of Austin Channing Brown's awesome book is um, White People Are Exhausting. <laughs> And I just I love it. And it's so true. And I've heard from so many young people who have been engaged in this work for a while of just like pure kind of frustration with how exhausting other white people are being um, and enacting newly woke, if you will. And that's the work, as you named. That is that is the work um, is to sit in it, to keep doing to keep doing our work, to keep checking in day in and day out and day in and day out, and then also accompany. Um, the folks who are who are curious absolutely let's see Ivy no pressure do you got something or do you, or should we move yeah, on I do um I agree with both Gabe and Ryan with the like speaking to other people and like just having conversations and then also like realizing like like white supremacy and white privilege and I've had conversations with friends about like 
what exactly is white privilege and what does it mean to have it and what do we do with it? Like once we've realized, I guess we have it now, what do we do? And that's also like a struggle that I've been having with myself. I'm a biracial person. I'm half Mexican, half American. And that's a whole other struggle. Of like I have white privilege that I, that I have over people of also my same color. And so it's just been really interesting to like just have these conversations and try to figure out like, where do we go from here? Like, okay, now we realize we have this power. Now, what do we do with it? And it's been really nice to like, at least see on my Instagram feed to see other people waking up to what white privilege is and then realizing that they have it. And then also watch them as they repost and as they discuss on their stories, like what they're trying to do now with that white privilege and what they're going to continue to do with it. And so I think that's just been like, this time is almost like as horrible as it is, it's also a very freeing moment for people to start discovering what's going on and where they stand with this. And so I think that this is a very powerful time um, where people are just openly being able to be political and to be able to speak themselves because like everyone is going through the same thing. And it's not just like, it's no longer me standing in a corner and yelling like, this is not okay. And now it's like me standing with a group and saying, this is not okay. And so I think it's just really important that like everyone is in this together now and discussing it. Oh, totally. And we're not free till we're all free, you know, and we're, yeah, we're starting to figure that out too. Um, yeah. One of my favorite quotes by Richard Rohr talks about how Jesus showed the free folks that they were in fact enslaved. Um, and there, that, there's a lot of that shift happening right now, which is exciting. And as Ryan said, absolutely necessary, right? Um, it's the white folks that have to do the work to change the system that sets us up to succeed. Um, one of the pastors at Bethlehem Lutheran, Meta Carlson, has very clearly said when COVID um, hit and we started staying at home, um, the spirit has left the building, right? Our church buildings are now, in a very exciting way, empty tombs. Like, Jesus is not there. <laughs> and so we, we've hinted at that throughout the panel that that's an interesting moment that um, the movement has where we're being kicked out of our church buildings anyway, and folks are joining out on the street to see what God is up to, um, how, how being political, how dissent, how dismantling white supremacy are actually acts of faith. Um, and so I'm wondering what, what does all of this have to do with your faith? Where are you um, seeing um, seeing God or seeing a sense of spirituality in, in this work? Open to anybody. Don't jump all at once. I guess I'll start. Um, I think a thing that I've been noticing a lot, at least within my church, is a lot of people are realizing like, like prayer is very powerful, but we're no longer living in a time where we can just pray and then call it a day and then be like, okay, like that'll, like, I guess God will fix it. Like we're starting to realize like we need to pray and then have that prayer lead us into action. And so one of the things that like really stood out was my pastor, I would call him a very progressive pastor, but he's very careful within our church about the stuff he talks about. And whenever he gives sermons that could touch on very um, sensitive topics, he kind of tiptoes around it. And recently he's just been hitting the subject like right on and he's been calling it out by name. And so I think that's something that's been really, like really big to me is like seeing that like he's no longer just like kind of trying to plant the seeds. Like now he's like really just hitting it hard and being like, this is like what's going on. And he even encouraged um, some of our church to go to a protest a few weeks ago. And so we had people from church show up to a protest. And as hard as that's been, there's been a lot of conflict within the church because of that. I think it's just been almost a like wake up call to the rest of the church of like, we can't just sit at home and be like, well, I'll pray for you. Like, no, we got to like pray and then have that take us into action and tell us what we need to do. Thanks, Ivy. That's beautiful. Anybody else want to come in? I can talk. <laughs> um, so I grew up Catholic and I now work at a Lutheran church, but um, 
for me through like Catholic social teachings, it's always been like your faith is, is not limited to like, I've never really fully enjoyed worship because it's been so disconnected. Mm -hmm. Um, that for me, um, my faith is, um, is how you act every day. It's like you, if you are truly a follower of Christ, what you do throughout your day matters and who you spend your time with and what you're spending your time doing is your faith. Mm -hmm. Um, that it is not just when you walk into church, like that is not your faith is truly when you leave the building and how you show up in the world. Um, and one of my favorite stories is when Jesus heals, uh, one of the blind men that he heals, um, and asks, uh, it's the one where he asks, um, asks if he can see. And then the man says, no, I, all I see is trees. And then Jesus heals him again. So this act of like listening and asking and how powerful that is. And I'm seeing that throughout of like, throughout the spaces I am, I'm in of like listening and asking clarification, um, then going back and that that is a dialogue and that's faith in action to me. Totally. That's one of my favorite stories too, where Jesus doesn't get it right the first time and healing is this extremely relational, conversational, you know, mutual, you know, the guy had the audacity to be like, no, Jesus, I would yeah. like to do better than this actually, you know? And, and I think that that's a really, really nice story to carry with us in this work of like back and forth, listen, act, listen, act, how we doing, checking in. Yeah. Um, that's beautiful. Thank you. And it makes me think of a little bit, um, I'm reading my grandmother's hands and about how uh, racial trauma is in our bodies and that we have to listen to how our body is reacting. Like your mind can be saying like, you're not scared of that person or uh, may have a certain reaction, but if your body is telling you something different, uh, that is where it is ingrained and passed down to, to us. Um, so to be paying attention to your own body as well. Totally. Um, and that, this is where I get fired up about, um, our, our faith being in the streets and our spirituality of descent is like, we, if you read, when I read the gospels closely, I see Jesus, um, as putting people's bodies at the center of things. And so I really, really think that George, that Jesus cares that George Floyd's body has gotten knelt on for eight minutes and 46 seconds. I desperately believe that. Um, and Jesus's ministry was not inside the temple, right? Jesus's ministry was out in the world, interacting with people touching them, listening to them, bringing them back into the fold, right? Like seeking out marginal people and restoring their bodies so that they could be full citizens. Um, and like very, like his, his ministry was political, right? He was killed for being political. Um, and he was actively trying to dismantle the systems of power. Um, and I think then that that's what we're being called to do. Um, as well. We see him crossing boundaries all the time and talking and healing and being with people he wasn't supposed to be with, right? So what are we being called to do in our faith? Um, like you said, to do that every single day um, and to have not have that contained to one building. Um, absolutely. Okay, well, folks, I'm conscious of people's time. So I were, the way that I would like to close, unless some, did I just cut somebody off who was dying to talk about that? Nope. Can I just say one thing? Please. And then other things. No, I'll just. <laughs> uh, November 2016, 81% of white evangelicals voted for the current president. Um, I'm curious to see if the last four years have been enough as people go to the polls in November of 2020 to vote for justice. Um, and because of election of 2016, I haven't gone to church much in four years because I'm so tied to the, that voting block. And that voting block, they're not just religious people that go to church, um, but they hold a ton of power in the country. So my, if I prayed, like my prayer is like, please, that voting block, like normalize changing your opinion. I've see, been seeing that on social media, normalize changing your opinion, make room for new, and vote for justice. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. So I'm gonna ask you to say one more thing as a closing statement. Um, that we are recording this um, 
It will be available on the TGIP website next week. So especially if you were in the call and you were impressed, we would love for you to point other people to it. Um, but so for, our, the, for the people who are with us right now and then for the people who will watch the recording later, um, will, you, will you close, and I'll just call on you one at a time. Um, if, if someone who's listening wants to join you in the movement as an act of faith, what's one thing that you'd tell them. You ready? Here we go. Gabe, you're up. <laughs> I would say in terms of characteristic, be curious. Um, you know, when you see people posting about things, click on them. When you see, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement going even to their page and looking at the resources, as Henry was saying earlier, um, I think a really great start is reading this book. <laughs> it's um, Who Was Jesus? And it talks about the historical view. It's by... Um, it's by Richard Watson and John Crossan. It is so informative for how I see um, restorative justice and how I think we understand Jesus in this light can really inform um, what it means to actually love. Because I think as Ryan was saying with how we love today, um, how, what that looks like politically and what we're prioritizing pr politically. So that's, that's in short. Thank you. Ivy. Um, I would tell them, honestly, just show up in who you are, yeah. um, whether that's your skin color, your nationality, your religion, whatever, just show up and just show people like this isn't just the minorities fighting for themselves. This is everyone all at the same time in one voice saying this is wrong. And so you just being there and you just showing your support is going to make a huge difference and so just just show up and just be there thanks ivy henry um i'd say um uh, both of those are really good um you know show up uh read learn um be open to new things and thinking critically about you know what you've been told in the past about uh it, whatever um and when you know you're consuming me reading books watching movies being critical understanding where uh things like white supremacy show up and then um yeah being open as much as possible and then assessing what you end up uh, being able to recognize your own strengths and then deploy those strengths accordingly because i don't know what you can do but you do so totally yeah thank you ellen um wear supportive shoes both figuratively and literally um <laughs> uh Literally, yeah, bring supportive shoes. You have no, no idea sometimes where it's gonna take you if you're actually physically gonna show up on the street. Um, and, you know, we've talked, someone mentioned this, it might've been Henry, that it's, this is a marathon, not a sprint. This isn't new, this isn't, uh, but people are finding themselves in it um, that are newer to seeing what's been happening. Um, that someone recently told me in reference to that of like you also have to prepare your body and prepare yourself like you would before a marathon and so what are you doing before you join the marathon what are the work that you're doing so that when you do show up um you have a foundation of understanding um so that you that you don't do harm to people um there's a quote i like that uh is if you have come to help me you are wasting your time but if you have come because your liberation is bound with mine um then let us together um so stretch your hamstrings literally and figuratively. Yeah, I like it. Let's go. Let's go. Ryan, how about you? 
uh, supportive shoes. I think I'll just, uh, appreciate that one. Um, if you're watching, and I'm included in this population, if you're walking, wa watching, and you feel like your reality is disconnected from these stories of oppression, like geographically, physically, um, this message is precisely for you. Um, so if once you start to peel back the uh, the mask of the status quo being unjust, you'll see just how many layers there are, how many people and places the the unjust nature of the status quo touches. And that can be really overwhelming. Um, and it's okay as a person with privilege to feel overwhelmed. You don't have to feel bad for that. You can feel that as permission. Um, but in that space, I would consider, and what I tell students is, who are the people and places already in your life right now? Uh, these people are your relationships for advocacy. You already have influence right now. You don't need to go build it somewhere else. So invest in the people and places already in your life. Uh, and then I suggest find the intersecting point between what you're already good at, gifts, skills, maybe it's, it's writing, it's videography, it's, I don't know, um, gardening, and then intersect that with your passion for justice. And that is your lane to move in okay. with the people and places already in your life. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm watching all these people think, okay, now the anti-racism work has to be this other bucket that's this the new stuff on my to-do list. And it's like, no, 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 no. You show up to the systems that you're already a part of and you poke at them. Like every, every, no matter what your job is, no matter what your skills are, that's where we're supposed to be um, doing the work. Yeah. And I think like, for me, pursuing, intentionally pursuing a combination of comfort and discomfort, right? And that's what I mean by comfort, is like starting where you're at, starting in the systems where you, you are already located because that's where you have power as your jurisdiction, but then also being willing to push into the discomfort. I think we need more endurance at being uncomfortable. Um, and then that's when Ellen's point about self-care comes in. And then a just very simple gut check is listen to Black women. Right. And there's a bunch of ways you can listen to black women um, and it can be on podcasts and it can be reading books. Um, but listen and listen hard. <laughs> um, follow folks on social media and listen hard. Um, and then if, if there aren't any black women in your, in your life, start asking a couple questions about why. Um, and when they and when they're generous enough to talk, um, I take it as a very. Um, very serious invitation to, to sit still and, and listen. Um, well, folks, this has been an extremely rich hour of my life. Um, Gabe, Ivy, Henry, Ellen, and Ryan, thank you so much um, for your time and for your wisdom and for your passion. Um, walking with you is what keeps me going, um, and you all inspire me um, to keep going out on the street, to keep dissenting and to keep doing it as an act of faith, as a spiritual practice. Um, so thank you so much. And like I said, for those of you listening, thank you so much for coming, um, and, um, for witnessing and, um, please help other people know that this amazing video will be live and, um, soon so that, so that more people can hear. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Friday. Happy weekend. Um, be well. Keep showing up and keep doing the work.